the people of sake actually brought me into sake. Back in 1988, this place was actually in Ginza on the main drag. At first it was kind of soy sauce, it was miso. To the point where it actually changed my life. New Year's Day 1989. Uh, not just sake as a beverage, but all the culture and history of Welcome, and thank you once again for tuning in to a brand new episode of Sake on Air, the world's one and only podcast dedicated to Japan's iconic and fascinating beverages, sake and shochu. My name is Justin Potts, one of your many regular hosts here on the show, and this week is actually part two. It is a continuation of episode 35, where we are examining the process, the excitement, and the challenges that go into starting up a sake brewery outside of Japan. If you have yet to listen to episode number 35, I highly recommend pressing pause on your player right about now, popping back there, spending an hour with us, and coming back to join us again here shortly thereafter. We are joined again this week by Mr. David Joel, the head brewer and owner of Zenkuro Sake, located in Queenstown on the South Island of New Zealand. And together with him, Mr. Matthew Shaw the co-owner and head brewer of what is soon to be Melbourne Sake in, you guessed it, Melbourne, Australia. This week we continue to dig deep into the discussion around what it takes to create sake in a place where it's never been created before. I hope you'll enjoy this week's show, and with that, let's go ahead and jump right in. In the spirit of making this episode as practical, as informative as possible, as I promised earlier on in the episode, I just want to backtrack a little bit and、um, ask you guys a little bit more questions about, you know, when you first decided to start brewing, somewhat commercially, what was like the first thing that you did? Like, did you look into like liquor? License regulations, or did you go about scouting a location for your prospective brewery, or did you look into, like Matt, you said earlier,、um, you looked into the ingredients and how you were able to source them?、Um, what were the first couple steps that you took?、Um, and you know, if you are comfortable enough to share with us a little bit of, like, you know, what was your expectations in terms of budget and financing, perhaps for the first year or so. Um, did you start off with sake brewing just being a hobby and somehow it kind of turned into a business, or did you set aside a good enough savings with what you are comfortable sharing with us? So, yeah, like what were the first couple of steps that you took when you first decided you wanted to brew at some sort of a scale?、Um, I think Matt first、uh, earlier mentioned he, you and Quentin quit your job. <laughs> and- yeah, very recently. Yeah, so what was the process like leading up to that point, and what do you foresee? And you know, how, how optimistic are you with the next couple of steps following? I'd say overly optimistic is、uh, maybe <laughs> been our problem so far,、um, which I think Dave will smile no, knowingly no. sitting over there having met us both. You guys inspired us, I tell you, when you came with your optimism and, and also your、um, stupidity. <laughs> a little bit of that, but、uh, you need some of that as well. <laughs> Come on, don't, don't pull no, but, your punches, Dave. But, but, but you're um, um, a different、um, generation, I guess, and your ability to, to、um, run numbers and see ahead and not just do one thing after the other, like,、mm. like um, old school, like, like, like I do.、Uh, you really impressed us. So, no, it's very、um, kind of you to say, Dave. You, you, you're you're going to be fine. I'm going to cry if you're not careful. <laughs> <laughs> spreadsheets.、Yeah. I remember the spreadsheets. Have you used it? I meant to ask you. You haven't, have you? Oh, I, oh, you I, haven't I, used I, it once, I, have I you? I showed the other guys. I made him a beautiful <laughs> I made him a beautiful <laughs> spreadsheet that he could use to figure out his blending ratios as a thank you. And I made it in Zenkuro colors and I got his logo on there.、Wow. And I knew full well he hadn't used it. And this is the, the moment I find out for sure. <laughs> the other I knew it. I was hoping someone would pick up on it.、Like、no, I knew it. I knew it. <laughs> That's okay. It was a present to you as a thank you for the time. It doesn't matter you didn't use it. It's fine. It's fine. It's fine. It's,、yeah. it's coming out. I'll be using it. It's okay. It's coming out. When you come back, we'll bring it out. Dave is more of a pencil and paper kind of a guy, you know,、oh. all crumpled up in his back pocket. <laughs> <Yeah> . <laughs> Uh, But Matt, you mentioned you went to study, or you went to kind of 
scout out the the market in the U.S. for about six weeks. Yeah. Uh, and then you returned home to Melbourne, and mm-hmm. you and Quentin decided it was for you. Yes. And kind of go head first. Yeah. So what was the whole process like? Well, yeah, I guess talking about before we we kind of just what is the core fundamentals you need to make sake? You need water, you need rice, you need yeast, you need koji. Can we get all of those things that are good enough to brew sake? And the answer was yes. Then the next step was, well, let's go and see people like Dave and people in the States. And can we make a brewery work in a small scale, using small equipment, doing it by ourselves? Well, yes, we can. Um, we probably should have taken more due diligence in the licensing and such things, um, which we're still going through now. We're both kind of eternal optimists and we thought if we can brew sake, we'll make it work. And I'm sure we still will. But I said my main advice is not don't let it put you off, but make sure you are doing your research and due diligence about <laughs> the licensing required and such things. Um, what, what sort of category do you guys, when you say officially, yeah. legally, I'm going to brew so, sake, what sort of category does well, that fall into? Well, that's one of the into? key problems we have, uh, we're trying to figure out now, and I hope there's no one from the tax office listening. <laughs> under taxation law, sake is defined, but it also comes under wine. So it's a wine product, um, which is good for us for tax because there's a wine equalization tax in Australia. And as a producer of the size we will be, that's incredibly beneficial. But then, so that's federally for tax. But Victoria, the state we're in, Melbourne, um, the liquor licensing, we're not defined because there's never been a brewery in Victoria before. So there's all kinds of biological arguments about does rice count as fruit, (laughs) yada, yada, which apparently it does. But that is a problem we've got at the moment is that federally it's defined for tax because there is that brewery in New South Wales. Uh, It's been there for some time. Um, But then locally, statewide, there's not a liquor license situation. So we have one liquor license now, which allows us to produce and sell. But we would need another license if we ever wanted to sell it ourselves retail at the space. So, yeah, that's one thing that's been more complicated than maybe we'd have hoped. But with a bit more paperwork and a few more Oh, we'll get there. We have to get there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah right? I think our return optimism is still a good thing. Yeah, that'll, um, it'll work out. For sure. But yeah, the only real two questions we had is, can we get the ingredients? Can we make sake? And that was enough for us. Um, I think, well, yeah, we have to get there. I can't have spent all this time and energy not getting there, so I'm yeah. sure we will. But yeah, that's one thing perhaps we're still going through now. So yeah, the only two questions, the only two answers we needed were those two things and that was enough for us to go, yes, I'm sure so, we'll make it work. So do you have a space now that you're, this is where you're going to be brewing once you're up and running? Is that all established? In your... So we have a temporary space right now, um, which is basically the corner of a, of a warehouse of another business that we're friendly with. They, this year, will undergo a refurbishment to do an event space, um, which the plan of which is we're going to be incorporated into that with a separate sort of fermentation room, if you, if you will, and a shared wet area. So they'll have a kitchen. Uh, for events and there'll be a wet area in the middle which will kind of be shared by catering companies and us for our washing steaming soaking all the water related bits and we'll have a closed off kind of fermentation room so temporary at the moment um yeah the aim really for this year is to be commercially releasing at some point um the rebuild is going to probably take six months from about now which gives us a couple of months to get brewing and get something out before christmas so yeah temporary space becoming permanent over the next six or so months in the same space Especially now that you've both quit your jobs. And you're- yeah, I mean, again, eternal optimists. Um, I can't guarantee I won't be needing to do some part-time work in some restaurants around Melbourne. Um, pimp myself out to uh, for the highest bidder. Um, but yeah, we kind of hopefully we need to again sit down when I get back from Japan and assess everything. But hopefully we can kind of work it into the business plan that we can both be doing, you know, very small wage, but be there the whole time. Like they've said, trying to brew part time and do things part time like I was before is mm. almost impossible. Mm. Um, it's not, you know, psycho brewing is a serious business. It takes well, a lot and of and passion. running a business. Yeah, <laughs> taking, exactly. So trying to do it sort of here and there and everywhere. Um, I'm sure it's possible. Uh, maybe not for me. I don't think I'm organised or uh, yeah meticulous enough to be able to make pull that off. So I think I need to. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I'm not as meticulous as Dave. Dave's saying he's not meticulous. I'm in real trouble. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, there's one thing I can do. It's a spreadsheet. There's one thing I can do. Um, can you brew all year round in Melbourne with the environment you have? And what about you, Dave? Well, yeah, so Melbourne, um, 
as I'm sure everyone knows, gets mm-hmm. gets pretty hot, uh, especially in summer. So you get days over 40 degrees pretty comfortably. Winter, coldest temperature, and again, don't quote me on this, but the, probably five or six degrees. So it does get cold. It's pretty profoundly continental in climate, but can't be relied on as a brewing season. You can have some days that are 30, some days that are six, that kind of jumps around. It's really unpredictable. So we're going to be brewing with um, glycol jacketed tanks to kind of, even if we just brew for winter, we don't know if we'll keep to a season or not. Uh, it's obviously easier in winter because it is colder and slightly more predictable. Um, but we'll be having to climate control the room probably, or maybe, I'm not sure about that, but we'll at least have temperature control um, tanks for sure, even if we keep to a brewing season because the weather's a bit too variable and warm. Yes, well, as I mentioned before, Queenstown... Um is a, has a cool, dry climate, and we we seldom get above thirty degrees in the, in the middle of summer. In winter, we go down to minus five. Um, sometimes in summer, um, it's maximum of fifteen outside. Um, so it, it's it's possible to brew all year round. Um, maybe to answer one, Marie's question a little bit, um, probably we've spent quite a bit of. Of money on refrigeration, and um, we've, we've got a a brewing room, so it's a, it's set at around six degrees. So we can we can brew inside the room. Um, our brewery is also in the shade. Uh, not many people <laughs> um, you know, would choose that location for uh, for other things, <laughs> but for us it's 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 perfect. It doesn't get much. Um, in winter, it basically gets no sun. It's very cold. In summer, um, it gets a little bit. So, so that's where the Moromi tanks um, and and some of our um, Genshu, the, the the sake of its aging, will stay in there until it's ready for processing. Um, and we have another room, and I think they've got nine old fridges. Um, so yeah, we've probably invested um, of all the equipment. <laughs> the most money we've used is on um, on refrigeration. refrigeration. Yeah. yeah. Mm. You have to say, before starting a sake brewery, I never thought I'd fetishize a half shipping container cool room like I do, <laughs> like Dave has. I go to sleep thinking about one, I wake up thinking of one um, in our temporary space, which has no control. So You should get a, a, a full container, not the half. Not half, okay. Not the half. All right. You yes, Dad. The, whole thing. the one you have in Queenstown is a half container size, Dave? Yeah, it's a... It's a full-size container cut in half. <laughs> <laughs> and you said you weren't good with numbers. Because <laughs> it couldn't fit a it couldn't fit a full-size one in the in the and in the room. And you mentioned your brew room is about six degrees all year round. And for those of you who are not familiar with Celsius, um, that's just about the temperature of a refrigerator all year round. Hmm. So um, it's cold work. Yeah, yeah. it is. Yeah. Yep. It's, it's uh, going to test it being cold work, as I'm sure Marie can too. It is too. hard work, and for those of you who, you know, who think working in in breweries is a lot of fun, which it is, but it's also you're also wet ninety percent of the time, you're, mm. and you're also cold ninety percent mm. of the time. Yeah. So it's hard work, but yeah. to be able to turn your business into something that is of scale and um, of significance as it is in as short a span as five years, do you have any? Do you want to speak to that, Dave? Um, um, you, you you have to obviously be very passionate about what you're doing, and um, you have to make some sacrifices. Uh, I think part of the reason you um, people go to Queenstown is for the lifestyle, hmm. um, which I've s- sort of lost somewhere. <laughs> 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 and uh, yeah, it's. Um, and I can second that a hundred percent. You know, it's, it's <laughs> such a beautiful town to yeah. live in. It's so beautiful, and there's so much to do. You can go hiking, you can go kayaking, and you can do. You know, you can ski and all sorts of things and paraglide. None of which really I ever got around to doing. <laughs> I'm really sorry about I, that, Marie. I, <laughs> I brought a pair of hiking hiking boots with me, but I think I only ever wore them two 
the brewery <laughs> um, and then later on swapped them for rubber boots and a whole day in the brewery. Yeah, it sounds, yeah, that sounds about right. Yeah. 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 So it is hard work, mm. but um, I want to hear a little bit more about mm. um, some training that you guys have had before starting to brew yourselves. Like what were the oh. takeaways from like interning or learning at Japanese breweries, obviously at a much, much larger scale, even the smallest brewery in Japan. I mean, don't quote me with numbers, is, but it's probably, you know, easily 50 times over bigger than what we were at Zenkuro. Yep. Um, so what were the takeaways from learning at a Japanese brewery and also at a, a much smaller non-Japan based brewery like in the States or in Canada? What do you say were some of the learning learnings that you take that you took away? Um, well, I guess I, uh, I, I started um, in Japan and uh, I, I didn't know anything much at all. I went to Yoshikubo Shuzo in Ibaraki and um, I just joined the team for a week. Um, I can I can understand Japanese. So I was able to um, take in quite a lot in a short time. And um, I've spent quite a lot of time in Japan. Um, so you know, I'm quite comfortable um, in that situation. Not a lot of talking goes on. And you're not really, you know, they don't show you how to do things. You just sort of watch and observe. And then when you feel the game, you put your hands in. <laughs> and you either get, um, no, or no. Or um, <laughs> you keep going, keep going. <laughs> so, so, mm. <laughs> so you know. continued silence might be the best signal. Like, <laughs> <laughs> continued silence is good. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I, 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 I think I um, was able to pick up on the on the culture and, and uh, really admired the the teamwork and the craftsmanship, um, and that got me really inspired. And I saw all the machinery, and at first I thought, how, how on earth are we ever going to um, put together a brewery in, in New Zealand? Um, I was like machines I'd never seen before, like the horeiki, you know, the, the rice breaker up a cooling down machine. Um, there's, there's in definitely... the words of John Gauntner, <laughs> the, breaker, the break, breaker upper cooler? Cooler downer. Cooler downer. <laughs> um, for example, and, and these machines and equipment that I just knew we didn't have. And, and I started asking around and about machinery and then got an um, idea of the, the costs. <laughs> and uh, it, was, it, was starting, it was getting quite hard. And then I went to Canada and there was a brewery, um, a one-man brewery, basically. Um, Kasugai san, the, the toji there, um, somehow managed to brew 5,000 litres a year all by himself. So I watched him do that for a month. And basically, he, he has no machinery either. So after, after a month there, I, I thought, yeah, we can do it. Like Matt, after he came and saw the simple, basic way we do it, uh, in New Zealand, uh, and I got most of the, the um, I designed our brewery and the layout and picked the, the tanks and the machinery that I thought we could buy in New Zealand. Um, when I say mach machinery, it, um, uh, whew, there's nothing really with a motor, but uh, a pump. I think a pump is the only, the transfer pump is the only only thing machinery we really have, other than the air conditioning. But uh, yeah, I, I realized it was it's possible. We keep it simple, we can do it by hand. And the original design was how, how can I brew by myself or, or, or set it up so that a brewer could brew, a real brewer could brew by himself. <laughs> so um, yeah, I, I got together a list of, of all the equipment we needed. Uh, and then started costing it up in New Zealand. Which is not always easy given, you know, things do tend to be a bit more expensive to purchase in New Zealand. Y yes, um, but but still a lot less than than um, insulated tanks mm. and um, and uh, the rice cooler down and breaker up a machine and <laughs> <laughs> um, things that were just not available. And, and uh, uh, another good example is at first I, I went to a brewery in Japan and saw that they milled their own rice. So I thought, well, I need Australian rice and um, and uh, we mill it, mill it ourselves. And then, How much is a machine? 
Yeah, exactly. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, so it's just that just means that it's not possible yeah. mm. to to start, mm. and uh, and then the thoughts. So we get. It. I actually found a, a brewery that offered to give me their um their one they didn't use anymore. Basically, give it away. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, and I thought, wow, here we go. Um, then, I th- then we was talked about. And I thought, well, who's? It's it's one that he's giving away. Um, it's going to break down. So who's going to fix it? <laughs> yes, no, I'm not that DIY. Um, so um, all the machinery in Japan it needs someone to fi- yeah. to fix it. Um, um, another good example is the um, the pressing machines, commonly called yabuta. yabuta. Um, um, I was at brewery in Fukuoka, Kanhokuto, Shizo, um, in December, and uh, broke down. The Yabuta broke down. It was the weekend. It was a long weekend. It was so, so it wasn't until Tuesday that, that that anyone could come in. You know, even even, even in the breweries, they they needed to to get someone in from the outside. So the idea of getting someone from Japan to <laughs> to fix machinery was something that put us off the idea of going at big scale. Mm-hmm. And I guess it's just for our listeners, just as a point of reference, so they know, cost is very prohibitive for pre-existing breweries in Japan as well, too. It's not a very competitive market, mm-hmm. especially nowadays. A lot of the different makers of different products, whether it be thermal tanks or milling machines or whatever, the number of companies that are producing that have decreased over time. And it's a whole be- series. Because of the number of breweries. It's the, the number of breweries have decreased. And so it's not a super competitive market either. How should I say? I'm trying to figure out. The, there's been lots of fantastic innovations in those different fields over, over the years. But it, because there's no competition, there's no need to necessarily rapidly produce new products because there's not a lot of new industry. And there's also no reason to price things competitively because they're the only game in town more or less and so for even a lot of older smaller breweries that are in a position where they need to purchase new yabuta or something like that yeah. or they want to buy a milli machine those th- those costs are incredibly prohibitive to yeah. even the smaller mm-hmm. the small to mid-sized breweries mm-hmm. that are trying to do that as well so then all of a sudden having to come into japan looking gosh it'd be nice to have that i mean they're luxuries, um, even like in Japan, too small breweries in particular. I mean, it's very still pretty rare to come across breweries that mill their own rice. I mean, you know, they have the milling machines. I was thinking probably that the most important thing, if you're going to brew sake, because you can brew, you can do everything by hand, right? And and like I say, a hundred years ago, they were doing, they didn't have this machinery. You know, the cooling of the rice as well, they were sticking out on bamboo mats in the brewery and, and doing it that way. But the one thing I think you probably can't do without is the press, the press, and probably the Mor- Morocco as well. And that's not something you might think about, but the fining as well. I, I heard they're very expensive, very difficult to get hold of the, the, the ones that they use in, in Japan. Um, would you attest to that? Or um, you... <laughs> um, <clears throat> uh, untouched was sort of a financial, <laughs> financially motivated as well too. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, uh, Yabuto is obviously out of the question. And um, but then I, I found out about Drip pressing and uh, sort of you know nashiguri pressing in the fune, yeah. um, and this I, I kind of like that that yeah. idea. And so we started doing the drip press um, made of fune in New Zealand, it's out of stainless steel. That became our system. Uh, we 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 drip press first and then transfer the bags to the fune and and d- then do a um, fune press. Uh, through John's um, course, we learned that. Um, uh, drip is best, next is Fune, and then Yabuta. That's right, Yabuta is not best. Everyone thinks that Yabuta is best, that's why all the breweries are using it. No, they're not. They're using the Yabuta for efficiency's sake to cut down on staff right. to make larger volume sake. It's not actually the best. because It's you... best from a business operational yeah. point of view. The extra air pressure actually presses all the kind of detail and kind of, you know, uh, the finer detail out of the sake, actually. You end up with something much kind of more simple and, and cleaner, I think, in a lot mm. of respects. Mm. Um, but you do reduce oxidation obviously that's uh, yeah, you know yeah, that's yeah. that's not important if you're making small volume though it's only important if you're making bigger volume really yeah. i'm sure it's the whole process that, you know, is, which is most important I, I think it's a combination of everything you do and you can you can press the the best sake in the world but if you don't um, look after it nicely for the next six months it's, you're just wasting your time you know this this 30 minutes exposure 
you know, or, or storing it in a big tank rather than in bottles. You know, you can cover, you can cover yourself by looking at those details, you know, small details, and worrying about little how you how you look after your sake. Mm. So we, we can we can do without. I'm not sure about Matt, but um, <laughs> we can do it without a. Yeah, but uh, now. Well, thank God. <laughs> thank God we can. It's much harder work, you know. Much harder work. We have to clean off the, you know, yeah. the, the, the yeah. kasu at the yes. end of it. It's yeah. much. It's harder work than the fune. The, the harder part about the fune is the actual pressing itself. But the after work and stuff about the cleaning the bags, oh, maybe yeah, that's a bit yeah. of a pain in the neck, right? Yes, it's, it's the job. Nobody your pillowcases, yeah, yeah. cleaning your pillowcases. That's when you get interns. <laughs> that's when you get interns, Dave. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I don't know if I'm laughing or crying here. Yeah. But, Almost crying. Um, but Fune <laughs> brings a whole new mm. sort of level of <clears throat> meaning when the the pressure is applied not by a hydraulic system but by hand carrying in yeah. river rocks local <laughs> granite rocks that he's forage from the surrounding hills that you have to load and, and, exactly. and come in handy <laughs> and you're you're bent over your waist yeah. carrying uh, some rocks as heavy as i don't know 15 kilograms or something and thinking oh gee you know new zealand the work safe workplace safety yeah, you better have some good core strength if you're going work <laughs> I mean, you won't probably compensate yeah, for it is Sake. You, you got like, you. Yeah, like, 100%. 100%. Yeah, 100%. Done. Branded. But your fune you mentioned earlier is a rectangular stainless yes. tank. Yeah. Did you get that custom made for you or was that like a, a rip-off of a wine production? Or um, Well, uh, um, Kasugai Toji in uh, Vancouver at YK3, he has um, a similar fune. Yeah, so I just... I changed his design a little bit, <laughs> and um, and had it made locally. Yeah, mm. so it's pretty simple. Yeah, coming back to Justin's original point about Melbourne sake stealing all of Zinkuro's ideas. Uh, whilst that's definitely true, that's never more true than the fune. We're um, we're getting a custom made um, fune made in a very similar way. Although we are getting a glycol jacket, just so we can press because we haven't got a yeah, yeah. a room for it to be mm. cold in yet. Yes, yeah, so we're getting it yeah. glycol jacketed to be as cold right. as possible. So hopefully we can keep it kind of five degrees while we press yeah mm. so yeah still stolen but adapted much much the right. same i think we'll, we might do copy steal it back it. we'll copy yeah, okay. steal it back <laughs> i'll send you the drawings when uh, when it's done yeah. i'll wait and let you know if it works before uh, before i give it to you it's how culture transmits yeah. between, yeah. between yeah. nations yeah. right this yeah. is good yeah. this is healthy it is yeah, yeah. but the funny you had they worked perfectly you had a spout at the very bottom in the center mm. and it would collect all of the sake that has been harvested whether it was a pressure press or a drip press yeah yeah initially it was uh, i didn't was have that the idea of it being also useful for drip pressing right but um yeah, it seemed to make sense we needed to drip it into something and we we wanted to do the drip pressing first so we, we tried hanging hanging the bags over the fune and yeah, it worked well still does still does mm. Mm. i'm curious about yeast you mentioned yeast a few times <laughs> um why is it that difficult to buy from japan um it's it's now not difficult so things have changed so much in, in the last four or five years um so you know we can just place our order for rice or yeast uh and and it arrives is that thanks to the support of uh, local breweries or i mean what's or is it um well, i guess it's thanks to people like yourselves <laughs> who are raising the profile of of sake um you know, for all visitors to japan and it's a combination obviously of lots of lots of people but also Japan's trying to export. Brewers n realize they need to export to survive, possibly. Not everyone, but, but certainly some breweries in Japan are, are seeing their survival could be through export. And and I think there's no concern now about little breweries like ours being competitors. Mm -hmm. Obviously, you know, we're never going to compete with Japanese breweries, so it's okay to give us some a little bit of yeast. <laughs> yeah. yeah. When you when you say place your order, who do you place your order with? Um, well, I was going to mm. say, I actually found mm. the Kyokai Kobo. You can actually buy them online. Yeah. yeah. No, place them online. I was, I was mm. sort of curious for it. Yeah. Like a, yeah. yeah. I was so just wondering of, if that's where you buy them from. As of, I don't know when exactly, don't quote me on the timeline, but you can join in it with an English language application form to join mm -hmm. as a brewer from outside of Japan. So um, definitely a lot of progression in that sense where it's yeah. not so protectionist and it's, 
yeah. they're saying the protectionism is not keeping it insular but raising the profile of it outside of the country so we can get 701 and 901 That's dried right. those yeah. are the two isn't it yeah Try so it. Mm. getting 701 and 901 is very very easy mm. getting other stuff would prove more of a challenge but you know you've got the two most common sucker yeast available dried from the brewers association which when Dave started, would not have been the case. It wasn't. No, it wasn't. He had to use other means to, to to get your hands on some. A bit cloak um, and dagger, wasn't it? You had but, a few <laughs> a few shady handshakes, as far as uh, I remember. You through customs at Queenstown Airport. <laughs> you wore a big trench coat, didn't you, with pockets full of yeast? That's what you told me. <laughs> with yeah. ampules stuck. Yeah, <laughs> ampules in places that maybe shouldn't be mentioned on the podcast. I I, I never did it myself. <laughs> I always got someone else to do it. <laughs> oh, but That's how you really get an internship yeah. at Zenkura. You have to prove yourself by bringing him an ampule. <laughs> Good. Yeah, yeah. Good. It's, uh... um, gosh, where's it? So, because of time, I don't want to keep you guys here all night. Just a couple things I want to touch on real quick. So, yeast covered koji, I'm very curious about. Mm. Both of your approaches to that. So let, let's start there real quick. Sort of where's where where did you start? Where are you starting? And what are those challenges? Well, like? I guess I actually inadvertently lied when I said the Fune was the thing I stole the most from Zinkura. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't realize I was, but I did. Um, so I, you're still doing the same, Dave? I'm going to speak for you. Yeah. So um, we're both currently using freeze dried koji from Japan. Um, we are trying to make uh, koji in bread provers which is what we saw done in a couple of places in the States who haven't got their own Koji Muro. Um, you know, it's a confined space that controls humidity, controls temperature. It's a miniature Koji Muro. One thing we did take from Dave and we like, immediately made sense is you've got so much to learn, learning how to brew, that that's a whole different task that you need to become proficient in and expert in. Making the Koji is a whole other thing that people do as their job. Um, so using the freeze-dried stuff, which you can get from Japan, um, just takes out one of the 24 million variables or limits it to some extent, um, which means one, you can focus one on... One major variable. Yeah, one, one very, very yeah. big, big big variable. Um, well, I think we'd both love to be making our own koji. Um, it's, it's the most important... Everyone tells you it's the most important thing. It is the most important thing. Any brewery you visit, the most important and proud thing is their koji room. It's the way they make the koji. But when you're just starting out and you've got, like we said, a million variables which can go any which way, if you can control one thing, while you practice your koji making, that's the way we kind of gone for it. So yeah, we, as I said, I stole that from Dave, and we're doing the same thing. We maybe think about focusing uh, our core core production being around the freeze dried stuff, and practice making our own stuff for kind of limited, interesting releases until we get good enough where we can actually make it consistently. Yeah, and, and um, perhaps you've done it as well, Matt. I think you've used um, a uh, miso maker's koji as well. We've tried it. Yeah. Yeah, I wouldn't necessarily recommend it. <laughs> well, so we we um, I have a, a friend um, who used to live in Queenstown. Um, he was also a hiking guide, Japanese guy, and his wife. Um, they moved uh, north to warmer climes t to become miso producers. Um, so w when I first started, I sent him some um, some of our rice from from uh, initially um, from California, then um, Arkansas. And he got him to make the, the koji for us. And it was pretty good. But each, each time is, is, is a bit different. And there's a problem with um, transportation. You know, it's still, it's, it's still active in, in, in transit. You know, if you've got, um, if you send it on a Friday and it gets there on a Monday, <laughs> it's going to be different from sending it on a Wednesday and getting there on Thursday sort of thing. So each time was a little bit dif different. Um, but probably, you know, until our 25th batch or so we were that's the koji we, we were using um and then um i had a visit from um either um either shoji and and osaka who um provide all all things sake to a lot of um breweries in japan and um they're, they're looking looking overseas um to expand their business and they turned up one day and introduced um dry koji to to us and um so i tried some and and since then that's what we've been using yeah. when you were using the miso koji mm. were you managing to get much abv because that's what we struggled with was that, that kind of classic theory is that your you know koji mm. uh, sake koji is sacrification 
mm. and then misokoji is more amino acid based so we found that we were getting overly umami flavor and not enough abv were you finding mm. you were getting a strong enough fermentation from the misokoji yeah the, the fum, fermentation was fine um it, it ended up very dry and uh, um a lot, yeah, a lot of umami. Yeah, I think <laughs> at that's the, same the issue. Time. Yeah. Um, and I think me and Dave both aren't scared of umami, but this, this may be a different level. It's maybe not quite as imbalanced as the, the sake specific stuff. That's what we found anyway. Yeah, yeah it was a great way to, to, to start and learn, um, but, but we, we kind of thought it wasn't the way forward. This is your first trip to Japan right now. Yes, I had you to start a sake yeah. brewery to visit Japan. Right, yeah, that's, right. that's what it took. Right, and after eight months of you've been pretty proactively visiting other international brewers yeah that's right what is so how, how long you've been in japan now three weeks now three weeks and I've you've got five left uh four and a half okay whatever. 25th of feb i go home whatever that is okay and you've been kind of popping around to breweries and visiting different yeah. places and kind yeah. of seeing what's going on what so far at this point what has been your takeaway from the japanese breweries what has been your takeaway here so far i think perhaps the quality of steaming from what i've seen is so far in advance from breweries outside of japan not everyone with specific machinery to do it, or maybe it is specific, but it's very old and kind of cobbled together in the same way you could. But the consistency and the achievement of the steam is quite far in advance from what we've been able to do and what we've seen outside, which is also from what I've heard, what a few Japanese tojis have said when they visited other breweries outside Japan. So lots of things they're doing better than a lot of people but the, the actual quality and consistency of the steam was something i don't think i've seen yet not to um talk down dave's steaming ability at all i've but, heard that as well <laughs> yeah. uh, right now i think actually the number one most important stage of brewing nowadays is actually not the koji i've seen so many breweries, so many breweries now telling me it's the steaming yeah well my, my cousin at sujay honten i was just at in um okayama prefecture she said everything's important but if you don't get the steam right nothing else is right so it has to be right so, you know, coming back to Dave talking about the sort of solemn silence of sake brewers, uh, when she was assembling and making the steam right, it was not a time to ask her a question. That was a time to watch and shut up and let her make sure it was right. Um, and that was very cool to see. And yeah, that's, yeah. she said, she said that. She said everything's important and the koji probably makes the most impact in the final product. But if you don't get the steam right, the koji's not right. So, it won't grow. Right. Yeah. You don't get the right moisture. Yeah. Cause then you can kind of take it back, I guess. It's like, well, if the, the soak's not right, the steam's not right. And if the yeah. washing's not right, it's not right. And if the right, you Exactly. Know. I mean, what about the washing? I mean, the yeah. washing might be the and most important thing. And sourcing the right in the first place. So like, you know, it goes back yeah. every single stage and it goes forward every single stage. But she was very sort of looked me straight in the eye and was like, steaming is important. Yeah. <laughs> and I was like, yes, yeah. my son, yeah. I believe you. A lot of breweries <laughs> have switched over to this <laughs> continuous steamer thing. Yes. Yeah. kind of through its jets of steam and it's very kind of, yeah, it keeps yeah. the the rice in contact with the same kind of amount of steam yeah. for for a long time so yeah. they kind of and these other one this other one's well i forget the name of it but some of the breweries have bought this really massive um steaming apparatus so i forget the name of it now but um mm. they all kind of both a few have visited and they're really proud of this big thing they've got it's just huge it's massive so yeah i think because uh, steaming was kind of always maybe looked at just something very obvious you know you, you just do it and then and then and now they've had the opportunity they've got the opportunity to kind of fine-tune it right and it makes every sense that japanese breweries would invest in having this apparatus to ensure consistent and superb steaming quality because i think dave looking back to my days at zenkudo steaming was one of the things that was a bit more unpredictable like we were steaming like the good old days method using a big pot in a bed sheet mm, yeah. <laughs> but sometimes it yeah. would come up perfect and i mean perfect as in the rice would be plump enough but also fall from the bed sheet without much effort you could just kind of scrape it and it would come in this nice crumbly yeah. and yeah. flaky but also moist sort of a mass and other yeah. times it'll just be caked up like mochi yeah. in the bottom or this one time we actually had a filming crew over for some promotional thing and then the the rice at the bottom was a bit overburnt and it turned out brown and we were trying <laughs> so hard to get that it was in hk yeah um. it was um we had a filming crew over from <laughs> nhk and i kid you not we usually did better we didn't always overburn our rice but this one time when we had the small filming crew over the bottom of the pot turned out to be rather golden brownish <laughs> <laughs> tasted pretty good it, it was tasty yeah. for lunch yeah. but um we tried so hard to not get that in the shot 
um so yeah like steaming mm. was i guess um up until yeah. now was yeah. kind of looked as a rather um less significant part of the process more sort of a production sort of a part of the process but i can understand mm. how it actually has a lot of significance to the to the finished quality yeah. of the sake it's also slightly a bit more unpredictable um i think in the overall process yeah, of the, things just the, the day um you know the temperature on the day and the temperature of the, the water can, can make a difference as well yeah it's how long it takes to reach the temperature isn't it like when you put you put the rice in straight it doesn't actually reach the optimum temperature straight away it takes time and, and that gap in between is this i, I hear is it like brewers tell me is it crucial yeah. yeah you get that timing wrong yeah you end up with kind of well, i i think for um small scale overseas brewers like us looking into that it's difficult to get it get it right but i i don't believe you need to invest in the big expensive boiler um you can improve for example a, a more powerful gas burner that we, we like we have you know improve on that you can improve in small ways um the material we don't use the sheets anymore marie um so I, I have the do tell the um the same material they use um steaming here in, in japan so we've had some little little ones made up <laughs> and uh i've got them i got a couple and tried it and and um the rice doesn't stick and, and the the, the what is it, sort of mesh size is just perfect um so improve improves the, the finished product considerably so little little things little adjustments like that um, um can make a big difference so yeah. i guess that means no leftover sticky rice for us to have for lunch no, there's no <laughs> you bring <laughs> your own lunch now model. it's feeding staff and getting everything <laughs> you need you need the gigi mite you have the gigi mite the, the G- fake yeah, rice um, you, is that hard to get hold of sorry there's a really like n- people listening yeah what's a gigi mite gigi you know? mite, it's um, fake rice right it's kind yeah. of like it looks like rice but it's like plastic balls and you put them mm. on top of the directly on top of the steam event yes so the rice doesn't make direct contact with the with the, yeah. the moisture in the steam and, yeah. and sticking to the it's that's all it's it's another thing uh, you know a, a small you'd have to have them um for example one of the giji giji my bags basically fills our steamer up so um and there's no room for any 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 rice so you know you'd have to have them specially made to um, down okay i see they're, they're quite big bags yeah um but definitely that's something that i'm considering and um ho- hopefully we don't need it but um yeah one thing I've noticed so far from my relatively limited experience of steaming is we tried without a fake rice equivalent. We haven't got the sort of legit stuff from Japan, but um, we did a steam, thought it was okay, not too bad. We used uh, bags full of gravel, which we boiled to make sure they were clean and free of stuff. And, uh, you know, DIY. Hey. Um, gravel from Bunnings, which is a well known. Yeah, 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 yeah. People know Bunnings. Um, <laughs> It's like a national treasure home base equivalent. I was just thinking maybe. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's like Home Depot. Yeah. yeah. But they're more proud of it than you'd ever imagine. <laughs> <laughs> it's a national treasure for some reason. I have no idea why. Committee. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, seriously. Um, did, did you tell them what you were going to use it for? No, of course not. Ask no questions, tell no lies, Dave. Come on. <laughs> um, so yeah, we boiled the gravel uh, and the quality of steam subsequently was twice as good, I think, at least. I really do. Uh, and we saw the same in the states actually, so um, maybe worth giving a giving yeah, a crack. We, we can copy that. Go yeah. and forage yourself some more gravel, uh, some more granite. Smash it up. Break down if you brought rocks. it back to yeah, Japan, yeah. then it would be Japanese gravel. It'd be authentic. Yeah. <laughs> I'll uh, I'll come and break the rocks for you, Dave. If you do it, I'll repay I'll repay some of the faith you put in me by breaking some gravel for you, like a beast yeah, of burden. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'll get some greenstone for you. <laughs> Just to kind of wrap up, is there any one thing that the both of you, in the process of sort of what you've seen experienced tried attempted succeeded at up till now that has been sort of a big takeaway that would be a word of advice or a suggestion that you would give to somebody who is pondering the idea of getting into brewing as well as please do share a word as to what your next step looks like or what you're excited about um i think perhaps i'm maybe a little bit too early in the in the development of the brewery to have a sort of main key takeaway that might be as useful as dave's but I'd say if you're going to start a sake brewery outside of Japan, just be ready for it to be as hard as it sounds. It's a huge, huge challenge. The, the, like Dave said, you can't get the equipment. You can't get the specialized stuff. You have to make do. You have to do DIY. Uh, it's 
whilst there's a huge gap in the market, I think, and hopefully we're kind of getting to the point that we can ride the crest of the wave a bit. It's not a get rich quick scheme by any stretch of the imagination. And, you know, it's a six or seven day a week operation during brewing season, at least. And uh, as I talked about earlier, the difficulty of trying to balance just, just two, two part-time jobs was difficult when you're trying to do sake. It takes a lot of concentration, a lot of effort. Um, and I think there's a lot of growth potential and a lot of possibilities for people, but you've got to be ready to get into it and make your life a sake brewer. So I'd say consider those two points. It's worth doing, but it's not a get rich quick scheme. It's not a tech startup that you can sell to Google in two years. Well, maybe if it's great, it is. <laughs> maybe it is. If you're Google. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Zuckerberg's you're listening. Curious about sake. <laughs> So, and and what's, up, what's next for Melbourne Sake? So yeah, I think I touched on it a bit earlier. Um, next is making the temporary space permanent and getting to the point where we can release something commercially that we can be at least proud of to share, if not completely happy with, because we'll never be happy with what we're doing. It's never going to be perfect. But yeah, just drinking the sake that I go, I would pay for that in a restaurant. doesn't need to be the best sake I've ever drunk. doesn't need to be, oh my God, if I 200 bucks would be amazing for this. It needs to be, if I paid for that in a restaurant in Melbourne, would I be pleased? And hopefully, we can do that this year. No promises. Again, if you're listening in Melbourne. <laughs> but that's the idea. How about you, Dave? I'm pretty happy with, with um, not, not, I'm not saying we've been successful or anything, but the road, <laughs> the, the, the path over the past five years has been just incredible. And it's everything, you know, I, I, I wanted and more than I expected we'd get. I'd get hopefully the rest of the team when we started. So um, the interaction with Japan and all these new people that we've we've met, um, new friends, and had people like Marie come come over and brew with us, and Matt. And now we've got friends. Um, I've been to Canada, uh, the States. Um, we've got friends through our courses here in Japan, um, Spain, and Singapore, Hong Kong. You know, it's. Um, don't think I changed too much <laughs> to to get the um, the standard of the sake better faster. Now that I know about it, just the things I talked about before, the lit- little things that um, um, like the material used. I mean, the guys in Japan have been using this for 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 long, long, long time, and there's a reason for it. It's because it works well, and they've obviously tried a different material, and now they have a standard that works well. Um, little things like that, small machinery like the the, the little rice washer that I bought uh, on Rakuten, you know, <laughs> for you know thirty nine thousand yen or something like that. It's, you know, and then I carried it home on the plane, <laughs> and uh, it was a big box. <laughs> but um, so how'd you get away with that? Yeah, it was it was big, but I, I got. They were more interested in finding out what was inside the box than than um than how much it weighed and how big it was. So I got through. But yeah, small small things. Uh, <laughs> just a rice washer. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, what are you going to use it for? Um, wash rice. I can only imagine the look on the face of the customs officer in a small Queenstown airport. <laughs> It's like all the people coming through with rice washers. You're actually just gonna wash rice. <laughs> so what's this? Oh, it's a part of a rice washer. So what's that? Um, it's a, some. It's it's a mold called koji, koji. which propagates on rice. <laughs> yeah, 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 actually the same guy that came through last month. <laughs> yes, you know. <laughs> So yeah, you can tell. You know, it's it's, it's a lot of fun. And this is a special stories. net that prevents rice from sticking to the pot <laughs> and what have you. Yeah, as requested by Marie. <clears throat> yeah, small small things. The yeast, uh, yeast, and and now it's available. I would go straight for seven oh one seven uh, nine oh one. Yeah, I'd second that. Yeah. You know, we thought we could make do with uh, commercially available beer yeast, and it's just it's just mm. not the case. It doesn't give the same strength of fermentation. You don't achieve the same kind of flavor. Yeah. I'm sure someone with many, many more years of skill than me could could do that maybe, but um, the sucker yeast was a huge difference from our homebrew batches to our sort of batches now. It's a big change. I agree with that completely. Yeah. Um, this, I think also a lot of the people get into sucker brewing uh, come from beer brewing backgrounds, and um, those people have got expertise and knowledge, and they know how to use equipment. They know about yeast. And so, so you've got a different. Um, those people have a different avenue to. You know, they can go down. 
perhaps Matt and I ha haven't got there. So um, <laughs> we, 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 we need to be um, a bit more authentic and and learn how to brew sake properly and close, to, you know, clo maybe close to Japanese sake. And then we can start experimenting with with um, fun stuff, you know, like fruit sake and cocktails. And first of all, we have do the basics, yeah. and we we can get a consistent product. Then there are lots of different different styles. We've started Murokana Magenshu, and we have a plum sake now. Um, and the Nigori recently re released a Hiroshi, um, or we call it Namazume. So just slowly introducing new things um, to the New Zealand market, and each time we do that, we have to we have to offer a, a course on what namazume means or what muroka nama genshu means. So just one step at a time, um, trying to to introduce you know, the, the the wide world of sake to New Zealand is is basically what we're trying to achieve. Um, from here on for a while, I think, yeah. Before we go, um, what would you say is the importance of sake education, especially when you're trying to market to a, a non-sake familiar market as you are, Dave, in New Zealand? Oh, uh, yeah, well, I've probably spent half of my time talking to visitors to the brewery pretty much every day. Uh, people, and being in Queenstown, um, you know, a, a, a tourist town, People from all over the world arrive and they hear about the fact that there's a, a sake brewery in Queenstown. So we just they call up and say, "Oh, w w what time can we come by for a tour?" <laughs> and uh, we we don't turn anyone away, but we explain that um, it's not really a tour, but you you can see watch us making and you can tr drink as much as you like and um, and you can't actually buy the sake at our brewery, uh, but we can point you in the right direction and, and tell you which restaurants and which um, liquor stores sell it. So we spend a lot of time, and then the liquor stores we sell it to don't know anything about sake. Um, though increasingly they they do know a bit, and the restaurants as well. Um, the chef or the um, food and beverage man managers are now um, part of their wine W set and what have you. Courses involve um, sake knowledge, so they are getting to know a little bit. But then all the people. Have the waiters and uh, who work under them don't know anything, so they ask us to go along um, and speak to everyone and explain everything. And sometimes they'll come to the brewery, so um, it's really something that I never thought we would be spending so much time on. But um, it, it it's a lot of fun, and it's um, obviously we learn um, from from teaching as well. So, mm. to your point, <coughs> do you think it helped your business? By starting with a smaller range of products rather than going out, you know, full on and having a Murakanama Genshu and a Hiyoroshi and this and that, you you started with a more sort of simpler set of products. Do you think yeah. that helped communicate about yeah, your yeah. sake yeah, more um, clearly to the to the market? Yeah, it's too it's too confusing if you have too too many too many products. When when I started brewing, um, you know, I I didn't know about Murakanama Genshu either. So um, I, from our courses and from watching other people, I saw that there's a white one, and that's that was nigori. <laughs> um, <laughs> and then there's a then there's a very sort of soft, um, sometimes aromatic, um, easy to drink style uh, ginjo. And then there was something that was a bit more full bodied, and I found out that was maybe the um, jumai. So we we tried to produce those three styles for a start, mm. and, and then we. That's what we pushed, and as I said, we're now trying to fill in the gaps with, with the other styles. Interesting. And how about you, Format? Do you see Melbourne Sake producing, you know, like pushing forward that Ginjo idea, or are you trying to come up with a, a, um, a label or a nomenclature that's a bit more familiar to the Australian market? Yeah, I guess so. Um, I think we'd be happy with one product to start with. Um, probably won't try and do a Ginjo style, just a Junmai that people can enjoy. Mm -hmm. um, one thing we do see as being sort of maybe a different part of our story to Dave's, uh, who's much more familiar with Japanese culture and lived here for so long, is um, 
making the words more understandable in our terms. Uh, I'm extremely un-Japanese, as you can probably tell from looking at me and listening to my voice and my uh, personality. So we wanted to make those terms more understandable to people who aren't familiar with Japanese. So, you know, we'll use English terms. So unfiltered, if we're not filtering it, unfined, whatever it is, drip press like Dave does on his. I'm trying to make that more understandable. We'd I'd love to have the kanji on the back, for sure. I always wanted to be the respect to Japan, uh, which I think is always deserved, and I'd like to have the kanji explaining it. But trying to make it English labels, English language labels, um, is a big part of what we want to try and do and make it more understandable. Education is the biggest challenge we all have, regardless if we're brewing or what you guys are doing, as I think everyone knows. That's why we're all here. The more people understand, the more they can appreciate. And the way we're going to try and approach it is hopefully trying to use... English terms that people are slightly more familiar with without losing sight of the sort of Japanese words and connotation and history. I think I think probably it's a double edged sword not having people, you know, savvy about sake. I think on one the one hand, it's difficult because when you're trying to sell your product, you know, you've got to go through all this education and it's a really, really hard work. But on the other hand, I think perhaps it's easier in some ways because you don't have the stigma surrounding so you don't have they haven't already made their mind up about psyche in whatever way that is you know whether they're like in george and my they're very very open and very much kind of it's a blank canvas and you can go in there and you can introduce what you're making and well you know if that becomes what they learn is sake then that's fine you know because the it, what's the correct answer at the end of the day what, what is what is sake right and i think you've there's a great potential there as well as it being also a very big challenge now i want to go to new zealand <laughs> and Australia. <laughs> and Australia. <laughs> Gentlemen, thank you. Where, If anybody wants to follow either of you, wants to get more information, where should they look? I'm quite simply www.melbansake.com.au or Melbourne Sake on Instagram. So please do follow us and hopefully we'll have some more tangible posts to share with you soon. Nice. Nice. And don't email Dave, but if you want to... <laughs> Send him a fax. <laughs> you have a question? <laughs> you truly are Japanese. A telegram, so. please. Um <laughs> Yeah, W W W um, <laughs> three W's uh, Zenkuro dot co dot nz or smoke signals. <laughs> Take it from there. Excellent, gentlemen. Thank you so much. Um, that has been you want to has been another episode of Saki on Air. Again, thank you so much to all of our listeners for always tuning in. If you have any thoughts, feelings about this week's show or any of our shows, uh, please do send us an email. Uh, questions at sakeonair dot com. You can find us on Instagram or Facebook at, at Sake on Air, Twitter as well. Um, reviews, please. We would love those. Those help us a whole great deal. Um, that is one of our missions for 2020. So if you can help contribute to that in any way, shape, or form, it is greatly appreciated. Until then, we will be back in another couple of weeks. Gentlemen, again, thank you so much. Thank Sebastian, you very much. Chris, thank you Marie, thank you. Pleasure. It's Good been to be here. Thank you very much. Really, really interesting and, and fascinating, I would say. Yeah. We'll continue this conversation at the local izakaya. Hey, cheers. Come by, gentlemen. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Hey. Hey. And that will bring this special two part series to a close. Sake on Air is recorded and broadcast from the Japan Sake and Shochu Information Center in the heart of Tokyo. And is made possible with the fantastic support of the Japan Sake and Shochu Makers Association. The show is a co production between Export Japan and Potsuke Productions, with editing and audio engineering by Mr. Frank Walter. 